you in God's house this morning. I'm so thankful that God has brought you here to hear the Word of God and to be challenged to make every day count, to thank God for every blessing that you have, and to know this fundamental point that I'm going to be sharing with you here in just a, a few minutes, um, and you'll understand why I'm sharing that point as I tell this story. I talked to my brother, Denny, about a week ago, and he was in the hospital and he told me this story, why he was in the hospital. He lives in Wisconsin, but he was traveling alone. He wanted to go halfway across the country to see some of his kids in Oregon and then in Northern California. And so he was traveling all by himself, and he loves to camp and had his camper with him. And uh, he was camping at a certain place, went down to a brook about 20 yards away from his camper, lost his balance went into the brook, struck his head, and was knocked unconscious for quite a while. Finally, the stream of the brook revived him. He was bleeding profusely. Somehow, he gathered his senses, gathered his wits, got up on his feet, climbed his way back up to where his camper was, called 911. For whatever reason, they didn't get there right away. So he thought, I'll take matters in my own hands, drove himself 10 miles to the hospital, was checked in, and stayed there for five days. Had a huge concussion, and they did some other diagnostic tests. And um, he could have and should have died. But... You guys looking at that? So how does that apply to the wise man in the story of Jesus and his fleeing with Mary and Joseph to Egypt? I'll get to that. So we have before us an amazing text where a special manifestation, a star, leads the wise men. We've heard this, and by the way, I've preached on how the star led the wise men and how the light of the Word of God leads us to the cradle, cross, and empty tomb. I've preached that so many times, I'm bored with that. You've heard it many times. I thought, I'm going to preach on something else that's related to the story, but isn't the story itself. So that's where I'm headed with this. So, the star leads them. They come to Jerusalem. They know that the king of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, although they didn't know his name at the time, was born, they just weren't sure where. So they go to Jerusalem and come to Herod, a guy by the name of Herod the Great, who had other sons, and he wasn't great because of the kind of guy he was. As a matter of fact, he was paranoid. He oftentimes would have his family members killed. He oftentimes would have his associates killed, and as the story is told in this story, he had all the children under two years old killed in Bethlehem. So the wise men come to him, and they say, where is he born king of the Jews? And he goes to the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees, the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, and there he asks them, where is this rival king? Probably didn't say that, but that's what he was thinking. Where is this rival king to be born? And they quoted Micah 5.2, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will shepherd my people Israel. And so the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes told Herod, who then told the wise men, Jesus of Nazareth, if you will, <laughs> although that wasn't his name at the time, the Messiah, this king, is to be born in a little town by the name of Bethlehem. Now listen to this. And Herod said this. Go and make careful search so that when you worship the child, come and tell me where he's at so that I might go and worship him also. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay. So they go and worship, offer gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know the story. Okay. Then they're told in a dream not to go back to Herod. They go home a different route. They head back east. Okay. That's why we call it the Star of the East. The Star led them from the east to the west, the place where Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Now, what's going to happen? Herod is going to put to to put to death all the kids in Bethlehem under two years old because he wants to make sure he covers all his tracks. Before that ever happens, though, an angel comes to Joseph in a dream and says, go to Egypt, get out of here as quickly as you can. Herod wants to kill your baby, your son. So they travel, listen to this, 175 miles to Egypt. Now, now many of you know that my wife and I and, and our little boy, who's not so little anymore, and you're going to hear a lot more about his story at the end of the sermon today, 
Okay, we went to Egypt, and it's funny that the Roman Catholic Church has a map of where Mary and Joseph went. <laughs> well, we don't know that's true. Um, there's no verification of that. Um, that may come from oral tradition, but we just don't know. One thing we know for sure, that Mary and Joseph went there 175 miles away from where Herod was, out of his jurisdiction, out of his control, so that Jesus was safe. So God protected Jesus in that place so that he wouldn't be killed in Bethlehem because it wasn't his, you say it, time. Did that happen in other places? Absolutely. When Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown, and people knew him, and they saw him grow up, and he read the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, that talks about the coming Messiah, read it to many of his family and friends, and said, today, this passage about the coming Messiah has been fulfilled in your ears. And you know what? He was saying, I'm the Messiah, and people wanted to put him to death, as a matter of fact, we saw the place in Nazareth where they took him to a high hill and they wanted to cast him over the hill to put him to death. But Jesus slipped right through their midst. God protected him once again. Why? Because it wasn't his time. In John chapter 7, as Jesus is teaching, the religious leaders are so angry at him that they want to arrest him. And of course, as a result of arresting him, they would put him to death. But again, he escapes. Why? Because it wasn't his time, and God was preserving and protecting his life. Finally, two and a half years pass. Now it is time for the Lord Jesus to go to the cross. Now it is time for him to fulfill his mission that God the Father had given him. As a matter of fact, as he appears on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, Mark tells us that he was having a discussion about his departure, which means his death. Now he realized it was his time to leave. It was his time to go to the cross. Now it was that time for him to leave the, this earth and to ascend to heaven and give us the Great Commission. Just a few days before he goes into Jerusalem, in that triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he tells his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and raised up on the third day. And what did Peter say? Lord, don't go. If you go to Jerusalem, they will put you to death. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You don't want to accomplish the will of God, but the will of Satan. In other words, Jesus was saying, now it is my time. Now it is my time to go. Now it is my time to be lifted up on the cross. Now it is my time to die. Now you're probably thinking, what does it have to do with me? Everything. I want you to write down this fundamental point, because it's huge. Doesn't Donald Trump say that? Huge. Okay, today's fundamental point, would you read it with me? God preserves and protects us until it is our time to be with him. That, and I'm going to be preaching on that the rest of the time today. God protects and preserves us until it is our time to be with him. I told you the story about my brother. So my brother calls me after being in the hospital for three or four days. He calls me on the phone. He tells me the story that I shared with you he said, I had to crawl up the bank, get to my car, drive all the way. I could have and should have died. And I said, Denny, the reason you didn't die is because it wasn't, what, your time. There have been times in your life when you could have and should have passed on, and you know it, and something intervened, namely an angel of God, the protection of God, the perseverance of God. God entered in, and he preserved and protected your life. Every one of us, if I marched 250 people up here today, every one of you would have a story about that. I should have died, I could have died, but God kept me safe. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, and think about that story right now, whatever it is, whatever that time was, when you could have and should have perished, but you didn't because God's protective hand was upon you. Close your eyes and think about that right now. Go ahead and open them again. 
Can we all say on the count of three these words? Because what God did at that time was his work. It wasn't because you were at the right time, the right place. It wasn't fate, it wasn't luck, it wasn't good fortune. It was God's provisional, protective, and guiding and sustaining hand. And so on the count of three, as you think about that event in your life, I want you to say with me on the count of three, thank you, Jesus. Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So you're probably saying, are you saying, Pastor Dave, that God protects and preserves our life until it's our time really to go be with him? that all our days are numbered, that he appoints a time for us to be born, and he knows when and determines how we're going to pass on? Is that what you're saying, Pastor Dave? No, I'm not saying that. But God is. Job 14, verse 5. God, you have decided the length of our days. You know how many months we will live and are not given a minute longer. Whoa. So are our days numbered? Has God predetermined when he's going to call you home? The answer is what? Yes. Look at this one. Psalm 139, verse 16. Pastor Tim already read this. You saw me before I was born. I love that. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. So God preserves and protects our life until it's time for us to go be with him. Now, this doesn't mean that we throw caution to the wind and we uh, put God to the test and we take unnecessary risks in life. It doesn't mean that we get in our car without buckling up. It doesn't mean that we don't buckle our kids in their car seat. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be good stewards of our body. We shouldn't eat right. I'm not saying that at all, and neither is God's word. However, we should not listen to this. We should not be so riveted with fear that we're afraid to go to the shopping mall. We're afraid to send our kids to school. We're afraid to go to a movie or go on a trip. God does not want you to live in fear for fear of us perishing, us dying, leaving this planet. Here's the deal. God is the one who ordained your days. God is the one who established your days. God is the one who calls you home when he's ready to call you home. And so you don't have to worry about it. It's all good. It's all covered by God. His grace is upon you. And you don't need to live a fearful life unproductive life. It reminds me of um, some people, you know, uh, some people will say, I'll say, how are you doing today? And they'll say to me, well, pretty good considering the alternative. Now, think about that, guys. They're believers. Should any believer ever say that? No, it's right. Why not? Because we know where we're headed. The best is yet to come. The alternative is being with Jesus, him calling us home. Isn't that where we're headed? Isn't that why we live our life? Isn't that why we repent and put our trust in Jesus, knowing that the best is yet to come? And when we leave this earth, when we leave this veil of tears, we're ushered into the presence of God forever? Can I get an amen? Then we should never say, well, I'm doing pretty well considering the alternative. If you're a believer in Christ, the alternative is going to be with Jesus. St. Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. So we don't need to be afraid of it. And now I know what you're thinking, some of you. Well, Pastor Dave, that's fine. But how does that apply to my life now? That doesn't have diddly squat to do with what I'm doing now. Okay, I know my days are numbered. I know God protects me. There have been many times in my life when he's kept me safe. I know he's going to call me home when he's ready, all that kind of stuff. But how does that change my life now? So what? Knowing all this, how then should we live? Here's the first way to live. We live with a trusting heart that we can go to the movies. We can go to the mall. We can take the trip. Trusting that God is going to protect us, that God is going to watch over us, that God is going to dispatch his holy angels to take care of us as we go, that we don't have to worry about it, 
that we're in the hands of God, that his protective and watchful eye is on us 24-7, 365 days a year. We trust him implicitly with our life. All our days are numbered by God, and our lives are in his hands, so we go through life trusting him. Right? Amen? Can I get an amen? So here's the second one. Thankful. Not only trusting, but thankful. When you've made it to your destination, when you've gotten to the place where you want to be, when you've gone to the movie and come home, when you've gone to the mall and come home, when God has watched over you and protected you, you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for getting me through that close call. Your name be praised. I, I Honor and worship and praise your name, God, because of your guiding and sustaining hand. I am thankful. I'll tell you what, you know what destroys a crummy attitude? Having a thankful heart. You know what destroys complaining and whining and moaning about your life? A thankful heart. To thank God day in and day out, week in and week out, minute in and minute out for all his blessings and his protective hand. We would not be able to take even one breath unless God permitted it. And a lot of times we don't think that way. Thirdly, we live unafraid. We live unafraid. Don't be afraid to go on the trip. Don't be afraid to go to the mall. Don't be afraid to go to the movies. Don't be afraid to do things that you enjoy in life. Don't be afraid to engage in physical activities. I love snow skiing, but for a year and a half I couldn't snow ski because I had hip surgery. And it's funny, you go online and some um, orthopedists say, oh, you shouldn't ski after that. My doctor said, if you can do it, go ahead and do it. So I talked to somebody recently. Well, aren't you afraid that you're going to get injured? Aren't you afraid it's going to pop out? No. Aren't you afraid something could happen and you could die? No. I'm going to live my life. Every time we watch the news and we hear about another shooting and we hear about another tragedy that happens somewhere, it fills us with fear. Does God want you to live your life filled with fear? Yes or no? No. So you tell Satan to take a hike, who's the author of fear, and you're going to say, I'm going to live triumphantly and thankfully and gladly and joyfully and Without fear, every day of my life, because I know that all my days are in the hands of God. And finally, we live with confidence. Confident of what? These words, if you're a believer in Christ, listen to this, these words, if you're a believer in Christ, should never come out of your mouth. If I got your attention... These words, if you're a believer in Christ, should never come out of your mouth. Well, I hope I'm saved. Well, I think I might go to heaven. Can anybody really be sure? Well, you know, I, I hope I've lived a good enough life that God would count me worthy to be ushered into his presence. No, 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 no. The only reason you're going to heaven is because of God's grace. If you repent of your sin and you trust in Jesus, you can be absolutely certain that you're going to heaven. Why? Because he paid the penalty for your sin on the cross of Calvary. He conquered death through his resurrection. He promised to come back. He promised that all those who believe in him, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. <clears throat> is that what it, what it says? Let me say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him could possibly, might, probably, surely might think about having. Is that what it says? No, I love the word will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will, shall, have, what? Eternal life. Be confident of it. So don't be afraid of that day when the Lord calls you. I've shared this story many times, and I'll share it again. I, I love seeing this guy by the name of Luther Zeshank from our church who was so ready to go. He was 80 years old, walked in. I was ready to share the Word of God. He opened his eyes, and he said, Oh, it's you, Pastor Dave. Hey, will you hurry up with your devotion? I'm trying to die here. <laughs> Why'd he say that? Because he knew where he was going. Do you? If you do, 
Live your life. Don't be riddled with fear. Don't be overcome by being afraid. Live your life every day. Thankfully, trustingly, unafraid, confident of where you're headed. Because God will, listen, fundamental point, engrave it in your mind. God will protect and preserve us until he's ready to call us home. And I pause for dramatic effect. I want that to stick. If you don't remember anything else about this sermon, God will protect and preserve you and your life until he's ready to call you home. And he knows the time. Many of you are new to our church. In the, how many of you have been to our church in the last 10 years? Raise your hand. Okay. Goodly, now probably two-thirds of you. So some of you are not familiar with this whole story. But in 2010, my wife and I had an opportunity to go to Israel. And we were there in Israel. Meanwhile, our little boy at that time, who was six years old, we allowed him to stay with his sister Ruth, who lived with her husband in Omaha, <clears throat> Nebraska. And so we went on the trip. They took care of him. One particular day, Tim had to pick up, my son-in-law had to pick up his mother at the airport. Now, Faith, our other daughter, who was living with Ruth at the time, and Tim there in Omaha, put Joey in a car seat. And she put him on the passenger side in the back seat. And for whatever reason, she determined, I don't think I want to do that. And he was all buckled in. And how many of you know that, I don't know if I can say this in the pulpit, but I'm going to, that car seats are a pain in the butt to move. How many of you know that? Raise your hand, okay? So for whatever reason, she said, uh, uh, I'm going to move it on the other side. So she did. So they pick up, Tim picks up his mother at the airport. They are heading to, to see his aunt, her sister, his mother's sister, who is dying of cancer in a nursing home. Joey is in the back seat on the driver's side. They're stopped on a two-lane road. The car ahead of them is turning left. The semi is not paying any attention. The driver is not paying any attention to what he's doing. Either he's texturing, he's falling asleep, but he runs into them going 70 miles an hour, puts them, bumps them out into oncoming traffic, and their vehicle is T-boned by an SUV. My son-in-law's mother died in his lap two minutes later. Our little boy was in the back seat, knocked unconscious. Not sure exactly why, except the hit and the hit like that jarred his brain quite a bit. He was in the car for over an hour. It took them an hour to get him out. When they finally extricated him through jaws of life, his eyes were fixed and dilated. He was barely breathing. On a scale of 1 to 15, with 1 being dead, he was a 2. They helicoptered him to a, a hospital in Omaha, and his situation was grave. At that moment, we received a telephone call that our little boy was in the hospital and he may not make it. And so we got, as quickly as we could, we got to Tel Aviv, got to the airport, got in the plane. God did amazing things to make all that happen. I, I don't have time to get into all that, but we got on the plane and we cried and read Scripture and prayed the entire way home, not knowing if when we landed our little boy would be alive or not. We landed, we received a phone call that he was still alive. As we were getting off the plane, a lady sitting right in front of us turned around and said this as we were getting our stuff out of the plane. She said this, I've been listening to you guys cry and pray and read scripture and I want you to know your little boy is going to be just fine. You ever heard of the scripture that says, we oftentimes entertain angels unaware, I believe. We look for that person at the baggage place, at the, the place where we get out of the plane, nowhere to be found. She was gone. At that moment, we received the telephone call that our little guy was still alive. He was holding his own. But the doctor told us on the phone that if he made it, he would probably be a vegetable. 
And the prognosis was guarded at best because he was without oxygen for so long. We got to the hospital. He didn't recognize us. He was in a coma, tubes running every which direction. Finally, after three days, he came to. He was hitting us, didn't recognize us, cursing at us, pounding, didn't know who we were, slipped back into a coma. Pastor Larry called me at that time. He said, how are things going? I said, man, dude, start praying because it's not looking good. And the doctor has told us if he survives this, He's not going to be good at all. And so Pastor Larry, without me asking, organized a prayer vigil on the front lawn of our house. And many of you were there. 200 people showed up praying that God would preserve the life. Listen to this, that God would preserve and protect the life of our son and that he would be okay. And I spent a lot of time in the Word, i got to tell you, in the book of Psalms, being comforted by that word. When you're hurting, when you're distraught, when you're anxiety-ridden, open up the Psalms. It ministered to me so powerfully. God was telling me over and over and over again, he was in control. And I read many passages that our days are in his hands and our days are numbered. And when he's ready, he'll call us home. And I said, oh Lord, let it not be with my son today. The next morning, my wife called me on... On my flip phone. Remember those flip phones? You know, I got a call from my wife on my flip phone. I answered it. My wife said, honey, there's a little boy that wants to talk to you. The next voice I hear is, hi, daddy. How you doing, daddy? Would you get me a Big Mac, daddy? I was at McDonald's. It was amazing. I talked to a paramedic, Kent Patton, who's here today. And I talked to him when we got back, and I said, what are the chances of someone on that scale, and he's a two in the scale of one to 15, one is dead, what are the chances of somebody not only surviving that, but totally recovering? He said, almost nothing. Next to Nothing. I can't say I've ever seen that, but maybe once or twice in my professional career. And then somebody called me and said, we thank God that your son has recovered. We thank God that your son is okay. Obviously, it wasn't his time. God protected and preserved him until it is his time. He did that with Jesus. He got him down to, down to Egypt so that Jesus would be safe. Many times in Jesus' ministry, it wasn't his time to go. It wasn't his time to go to the cross. And God kept him safe because it wasn't his time. Know this, that God is going to protect and preserve your life until it's time for you to be with him. And until then, live your life this way, trusting in him, thanking him for his protection, and perseverance, living a life unafraid and being confident of where you're going when he calls you home. This is the only way to live. Amen? This is the only way to live. Amen? Amen. There is no other way. You can live your life in fear all the time, you turn on the news and you hear another story and you're overwhelmed with fear and you're worried about your life and the life of your kids, don't be afraid. Travel, go to the mall, go to movies, send your kids to school because all our days are in his hands. Knowing that, Live out your life with gratitude, thanksgiving. Live it unafraid and confident of where you're going to be when he finally does call you home. There is no other way to live. Oh, by the way, why did faith put that car seat on the other side? Because it wasn't Joey's time. That's all we can say.
Amen? And now,